Hello and welcome to another episode of Zenotes Life. Today we have Sarvesh with us who will be going through A-level chemistry papers. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm Sarvesh. I recently completed my A-level in physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology. And besides that, I have also scored a bronze medal in the International Chemistry Olympiad 2022. Okay, we will get started with the lesson right now. Um, okay, so today we will be doing the A-level chemistry paper 4, variant 1 from the May June 2022 exam session. So over here in our first question, we are asked that the solubility of group 2 sulfates decreases going down the group, and we're supposed to explain this trend. So what we know about solubility is that it depends on the enthalpy change of solution, which is del H solution, which is equal to the enthalpy change of hydration minus the lattice energy. So the more negative that this becomes, your solution gets more soluble. So as it gets more negative, the solubility increases. So while you go down the group, you see that the hydration, the enthalpy change of hydration, it becomes less negative and so does the enthalpy change of the lattice and the lattice energy however the enthalpy change of hydration it decreases by a larger extent than the lattice energy so at the end of the day you see that your enthalpy change of solution instead of becoming more negative which is favored if you wanted to get more soluble it instead becomes less negative. So basically what you can say is that the del H hydration gets negative along with the lattice energy. And you can mention that the hydration enthalpy gets less negative by a larger extent than the lattice energy and you have your enthalpy change of solution you could just write this equation over here and using that you can explain that the solubility decreases because you see a less negative change in the enthalpy change of solution so in part b we are asked what we observe when magnesium and barium are reacted separately with an excess of dilute sulfuric acid. So when you react these, you would get magnesium sulfate and barium sulfate. So relating these to the group two sulfates, this is a soluble sulfate. This is insoluble. So generally when you put a metal in an acid, you see fizzing. So that happens in both of these cases. However, since magnesium sulfate is soluble, you won't see any other forms of precipitates or anything, just bubbles of hydrogen gas which is being evolved. But in the case of barium sulfate, you will see um, white precipitates of barium sulfate. In part C, we are told that the solubility product, KSP of barium sulfate, is 1.08 times 10 to the power negative 10 mole squared dm raised to the power negative 6. So we are asked to find the solubility of barium sulfate in gram per centimeter cube of solution. So how are we going to do this? So what we know is that barium sulfate, it ionizes as Ba2 plus plus sulfate. Just one minus over here. So our KSP expression would be the concentration of barium ions times the concentration of sulfate ions. So let's just assume the solubility of barium sulfate to be X. Then you would also find the solubility, which is the concentration of that substance in 
the solution. So basically the concentration to be X over here and X over here as well by the stoichiometric ratio. So you could just assume these to be the solubility of barium sulfate. So 1.08 times 10 to the power negative 10 equals to X squared. So taking the squared root of that, you would get, let's see, 1.04 times 10 to the power negative five mole per dm cube. Okay, but over here, your unit is mole per dm cube. Meanwhile, you need it in grams per 100 centimeter cube. So we will be converting the units as 1.04 times 10 to the power negative five times 233.4. This is the uh, relative molecular mass of BASO4. So we've converted moles to grams by multiplying it by this factor. And now we will convert dm cubed to centimeter cubed by dividing it by 10 because over here we've got 1000 centimeter cube, which is one DM cube. We'll be converting 1000 centimeter cube to 100 centimeter cube. So just divide it by 10. So that would give you a 2.43 times 10 to the power negative four. And that would be your answer. Two point four three times ten to the power negative four. And in part D, we are asked to calculate the standard enthalpy change of formation of sulfate ions. So we are given that the enthalpy change, uh, the equation of the formation of sulfate ions over here. And we are given data such as the lattice energy of barium sulfate, the formation of barium sulfate. So this is a question which involves lattice energy. Okay, so let's see how you can form barium sulfate first. So you take barium two plus ions plus sulfate ions in gaseous phase and they form BASO4 solid. This would be your lattice energy. Let me just name them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So this would be, um, let's see, A from over here. Meanwhile, you will be forming this as you can also form that from the element in its standard state. Like this. And this would be enthalpy change of formation of barium sulfate, which is given as the enthalpy change B. But you can also go this route over here using Hess's law. So let's see how you can form those. So from barium solid, first you will make atoms of barium, so barium gaseous. This would be your standard enthalpy change of atomization. Let's see where we have this. Energy C. From atoms of barium, you'll form ions one plus ions of barium. So you will form barium one plus gaseous. This would be your enthalpy D. And from that you form Ba2 plus G. So let me just extend this arrow. What's that? That would be your enthalpy change E. Okay, so 
you don't quite have the data on how you form all of these stuff. However, you just know that it is a variable delta H. So from these stuffs, you can form this as delta H. So by Hess's law, you would now have C plus D plus E plus delta H plus delta A lattice energy over here, which is A, let me just write A. plus A, would be the same as B. Okay, so that would be your equation to find out delta H. So what is the value of C? This would be 180 plus 503 plus 965 plus delta H plus negative 2469 is equal to negative 1473. Okay, I needed to squeeze that a bit. So solve that, you would end up with delta H equals minus 652 kilojoules per mole. That is how we solve this question using Hess's law. So the, the uh, enthalpy change of formation of sulfate ions is 652 kilojoules per mole. We are asked how would the lattice energy of barium sulfate solid differ from the lattice energy of cesium sulfate. So what we know over here is that Cesium is a group one metal, which lies a bit quite low in the periodic table. Meanwhile, barium is a bit higher. So the ionic radius of barium is greater than the ionic radius of cesium. So if you form a lattice of barium sulfate, you would have the cations and the anions quite closer to each other in contrast to a lattice of cesium sulfate. So that means that you would have stronger attractions in the case of barium sulfate compared to cesium sulfate. Also, barium sulfate, it has, barium and barium sulfate has a charge of 2 plus. Meanwhile, cesium is just a single positive charge. So barium also has greater charge than cesium. So stronger attraction due to um, lesser ionic radius and greater charge. So we see that the ions in barium sulfate would have stronger attraction, which means the lattice energy would be less negative, thereby indicating the stronger attraction. And you can justify this using the points over here. Okay, moving on to part E, the reaction of solid hydrated barium hydroxide, BaOH2, 8H2O with ammonium salts is endothermic. Calculate the minimum temperature at which the reaction becomes feasible. Okay, so what we know is that for the reaction to be feasible, the Gibbs free energy should be greater or equal to zero. If it's, I mean, it should be lesser or equal to zero. If the Gibbs free energy is greater or equal to zero, the reaction is not feasible. When Gibbs free energy is exactly zero, it's 
just feasible, like it just becomes to be feasible, the lesser it goes, the even more feasible it becomes. Okay, so here we will just say delta g equals zero. And let's write the equation for delta g. So let's see. Um, you would have delta g equals to until we change minus t delta s. So zero equals to delta h minus t delta s. So delta h divided by delta s equals t. Okay, so what is the enthalpy change of reaction over here? It's 132 kilojoules. So times 10 to the power 3 joule per mole. We're keeping it in the same units, so we need to divide it. If we had our enthalpy in kilojoules and this in joules, we couldn't divide it, so we're making the unit same. So you could cancel out joules, moles. This in first Kelvin will go over there above. We would end up with a value of 214.3 Kelvin. So this is the minimum temperature at which the reaction becomes feasible. But you're asked for the answer in degrees Celsius, so subtract 273. Kelvin from the answer, you would end up with negative 58.7 degrees Celsius. So our answer is negative 58.7 degrees Celsius. Okay, so barium hydroxide reacts readily with ammonium chloride on mixing at room temperature. Some relevant standard entropies are given. So calculate the standard gas for energy for this reaction at 25 degrees Celsius. So we already have our enthalpy change, and we are given the entropies of the reactants and products. So we need to first find out the entropy of the system, or the entropy change of reaction, whatever you prefer to call it. So that would be um, the entropy of products minus entropy of reactants, 2 times 192 over here. My plus the value for BACL2 plus 203 plus the value for water 8 times 70 minus BAOH2 dot 8H2O so minus 427 plus 2 times 95 so that would be our entropy change of reaction so this would have you end up with a figure of positive 530 joules per Kelvin per mole. So now let's calculate our and our Gibbs free energy, which is delta H minus T delta S. So 133 kilojoule per mole minus What's the temperature over here? 25 degrees Celsius, so that would be 298 kelvins times 530 joules per kelvin per mole. We are dealing with the units in kilojoules, so let's divide this by a thousand. So doing the calculations, you would end up with a gives free energy of 24.9 kilojoule per mole. Okay, so that's our gives free energy over here, minus... 24.9 kilojoule per mole. Okay, so we're done with question one. So question two, we are asked what a transition element is. So based on what's defined in the book, a transition element is an element which forms um, one or more stable ions. So it should have one or more stable ions. And you also have a condition for the one or more stable ions formed, which is that 
they should have a partially filled d orbital so if it does not have a partially filled d orbitals it is not a transition element even if it has one or more stable ions so sketch the shape of a 3dz squared orbital okay so it's kind of like this okay i'm not the best artist in the world so you have this dumbbell shape kind of thing and a donut which is around the dumbbells okay, wait. so yeah it kind of looks sort of like that yep a dumbbell and a donut Manganese 4 oxide MnO2 acts as a heterogeneous catalyst in the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide H2O2. Explain what is meant by a heterogeneous catalyst. Okay, so let's suppose you have a reaction between liquids and liquids. You have products. Meanwhile, you use a solid catalyst. So what you see over here is that Okay, I've got liquid, a liquid, and a solid. So the catalyst, it isn't in the same state, the same phase as the reactants. So this is a heterogeneous system where there are different phases. So the catalyst, which is not in the same phase as the reactants, that's a heterogeneous catalyst. So, yeah different phase as the reactants so how do heterogeneous catalysts work in a reaction so let's talk about manganese oxide so let this be a very 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 zoomed in structure of a mno2 particle so over here in the metal you have the h2o2 molecules which get adsorbed okay so add sorb adsorbed okay never mind i suck at spellings it gets adsorbed to the surface of the metal and in the surface of the metal you've got reactions occurring and in this case you end up with the decomposed hydrogen peroxide so you will end up with the reactants so over here, you could write adsorption of reactants at the surface of catalyst. The bonds in the reactant weaken. The reaction takes place. And as we just talked, the products, they get desorbed. So manganese 6, 7, manganese 7 oxide Mn2O7 can be made by the, treat, treat, by the treatment of potassium permanganate with concentrated sulfuric acid. Mn2O7 readily decomposes at room temperature to form manganese 4 oxide and a colorless diatomic gas. Construct equations for both the reactions. Okay. So, um, this would be Mn2O7 plus concentrated sulfuric acid H2SO4. Okay, wait, no. This over here, it would be KMnO4. KMnO4 plus concentrated sulfuric acid would give Mn2O7, okay, plus a salt. So 
that salt could be potassium sulfate or sulfite, K2SO4 or KHSO4. So let's just say K2SO4 forms. And you've also got H over here, so there would also be water. Let's balance this. Two K2. Okay, yeah, it's balanced. Okay, so potassium permanganate reacts with the sulfuric acid to form manganese 7 oxide, potassium sulfate, and water. The reaction 2. Mn2O7 decomposes. Mn2O7 decomposes to form manganese 4 oxide. So the manganese 4 oxide is MnO2 and a colorless diatomic gas. The only gas which can form over here is oxygen. So let's see if this is balanced. Okay, this would be 3 by 2. Okay, so this is balanced. Aqueous manganese 2 ions show similar chemical properties to aqueous copper 2 ions when reacted separately with NaOH and concentrated HCl. Write the ionic equations and say the type of reaction for the reaction of MnH2O6, 2 plus with NaOH. So it says that it's similar to copper ions, okay? So we could just say mm, MnOH2 is formed along with water. Six molecules of water, I think. So MnH2O6 plus OH minus 2OH minus gives MnOH2 plus 6H2O. So what type of reaction this is? Okay, so we can say um, it is a precipitation reaction because MnOH2 is a precipitate. But this is also an acid-base reaction. So you could say any of those two. Or you could also go further and say this is a deprotonation reaction. Because the proton is being extracted. So write the ionic equation and state the type of reaction for the reaction of MnH2O6 with concentrated HCl. Okay. So what I'd assume is that manganese chloride to form, which has a charge of 2 minus. So let's see what else can form from this. Okay, basically just water. Um, I guess since this is concentrated HCl, it's fine if I just write Cl minus, okay, so 4 Cl minus plus 6 H2O. This would be a ligand exchange reaction, or also a substitution reaction because you're just substituting their ligands, basically just exchanging them, or a displacement reaction, or anything. Table 2.1 lists relevant electrode potentials for some electrode reactions. Suggest the formulas of manganese species formed when Mn2 plus reacts with Cl. So we're supposed to suggest the formula of the manganese species formed when Mn2 plus aqueous reacts with Cl2. So we are given some electrode potentials over here in Table 2.1, and we are just told to suggest a formula to manganese species. So a possible manganese species that can be formed over here is MnO2, looking at the data, because it is told that Mn2 plus reacts with Cl2. So it would be MnO2. And the type of reaction would be redox reaction and I think that we do not need to go into any more depth regarding the electrode potentials in this question because it's a question of one mark, so I don't think that's being asked. So, moving on to question three. 
the rate of reaction between two chlorotube methylpropane, CH33CCL, okay, so two chlorotube methylpropane, CCC, mm -hmm. CH3, CL, CH3H3C, okay, so this is a molecule, and methanol, okay, CH3OH, is investigated. When a large excess of methanol is used, the overall reaction is first order. Okay. Use the graph to determine the rate of reaction at 40 seconds. Show all your working. Okay. So, rate of reaction at 40 seconds. So, let's see where is 40 seconds. Mm, okay, so yeah. I would think this would be 40 seconds. And while doing it on paper, you're supposed to draw a tangent over here like this. This is not the best tangent in the world, but still, this sort of counts. Let's say it counts. And then you would end up with an answer. So based on the mark scheme, the answer which you should get would be 0 0.000170 mole per dm cubed second inverse. So I'm unable to do this right now because I can't draw a tangent. Use the graph to show that the overall reaction is first order. Explain your answer. Okay, so over here we are supposed to talk about the half-lives. Okay. So let's see what are the half-lives over here. So over here, you're, it's at 0 .0 0 0.0200. So the concentration is half over here. Okay, so this would be your first half-life. And then the concentration again gets half over here. This would be our second half-life. Okay, so, and over here you will get a third half-life. Okay, so you are now supposed to compare the areas of these half-lives. So in order to show that the overall reaction is first order, you would end up with the subsequent half-lives as equal. In a different reaction, which is also first order, 75% of the reactant is consumed in 320 seconds. Calculate the rate constant K for this reaction. So, yeah. In your first half-life, 50% of the reaction is completed. Then in your second half-life, 25% is completed. So over here, you have two half-lives equals... 320 seconds so one half life would be 160 seconds so we are told that the uh, rate constant k equals to ln2 divided by the half life or you could just say 0 0.693 divided by half life so this would be 0 0.00433 per second. Okay, so your answer over here is 0 0.00433 per second. So that's our rate constant K. In part C, define the standard electrode potential so the standard electrode potential is the um, voltage measured uh, when a half cell is connected to a standard hydrogen electrode under standard conditions. 
you should not miss the part of standard conditions because we are asked about the standard electric potential. A salt bridge is used in an electrochemical cell. Say the function of the salt bridge. So what the salt bridge is that do is that the ions, they move through the salt bridge. Okay, so over here you've got ions, they move through the salt bridge. So the salt bridge helps in maintaining a charge balance between the electrochemical cells. And without the salt bridge, you wouldn't have a charge balance, the ions wouldn't move, your circuit wouldn't be complete. And basically the cell wouldn't function, it would be dis dysfunctional without the salt bridge. Complete the diagram of the apparatus that can be used to measure the standard electrode potential of uh, CR2072 minus H plus aqueous CR3 plus aqueous against the standard hydrogen electrode. So in the left side, we will be drawing the standard hydrogen electrode. So you've got the platinum black thing over here. This gets connected to the voltmeter. Over here, your hydrogen gas will escape from H2G. This would be platinum. Over here, you would have one mole per dm cube of hydrogen ions, so one mole per dm cube of an acid. And over here, in this, Half cell, you would have a solution of, let's see what's mentioned, okay, of this stuff, CR207, 2 minus aqueous, H plus aqueous, CR3 plus aqueous, so basically this is all these stuffs. And since it's a solution, you also will be using platinum in this case over here. So just PTS. Okay, don't forget the S over here. Okay. And the conditions. So what are the conditions? 298 Kelvin. Um, 1 ATM pressure and one mole per dm cube of concentration so you can just write one mole per dm cube over here like this and like this or just write it above over here the standard electrode potential of cr2072 minus blah 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 electrode is 1.33 volt label the negative electrode and the direction of electron flow in the external circuit when the current flows in your diagram. So the standard electrode potential is plus 1.33 volt. We know that the electrode potential of the hydrogen cell is always zero volt. So the electrode potential of the other half cell would be 1.33 volt. So this is greater than zero volt, so I would say this is the positive electrode and this is the negative electrode, okay? And the direction of electron flow. So the electrons would be flowing from the negative electrode to the positive electrode, so an arrow over here. Table 3.1 lists relevant electrode potentials for some electrode reactions for use in D1 and D2. So ethanol is oxidized to ethanoic acid in the presence of Cr2072 minus. Construct an ionic equation for the oxidation. Basically, just remember from organic that this reaction would be CH3, CHO plus O would give CH3 
3COOH. Okay, so this is our reaction over here. And we will be modifying this a bit. So it fits over here. So the ionic equation. Okay, so CH3 CHO plus CR2O7 2 minus plus 8H plus. So this is a reaction which is actually given in the book, I think, in the carboxylic acid chapter. So basically, this is a reaction for the book. 2Cr3 plus plus 3CH3COOH plus 4H2O. So this is what happens. What is the electrode potential of the cell? Okay. So the electrode potential of the cell would be Hmm. Let's see over here what we're doing. CR3207 plus 14H plus 60 minus. CH3CHO. Okay. And the inverse of this. So 1.33 plus 0 0.94. That would be 2.27, okay. So 2.27 volt. In an ethanol oxygen fuel cell, CH3CH2OH, an O2 are in contact with two inert electrodes immersed in an acidic solution. Calculate the Gibbs free energy for the oxidation of ethanol by oxygen. Okay, so we would be using delta G equals to minus NFE. Okay, standard. Standard cell, okay. So how many electrons are we talking about over here? So oxygen, based on this, it reacts with four electrons. Okay, so minus four times Faraday's constant, nine six y zero zero times 2.01 joules. Okay, so our final unit over here would be joules. This would be negative 775860 joules, which is negative 775.8 kilojoule per mole. Our least number of significant figures is three, so negative 776 kilojoules per mole. So another way of doing this over here is taking these two reactions and then multiplying this by three so that the number of electrons cancel out and solving it. Okay, so that was another method of doing it. The 3D orbitals in an isolated Fe2 plus ion are degenerate. Complete the diagram to show the splitting of 3D orbitals. Orbital energy levels in an isolated Fe2 plus ion and when Fe2 plus forms an octahedral complex. Okay. So, over here, your 3D orbitals. One, two, three. They would be one, two, three, four. Okay, five. Is this five? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, five of them are in the same energy level. And then in the case of an octahedral complex, the 3D orbitals, they split. Okay, so you would have two orbitals in a higher energy level and two in a lower energy level. Okay. So this would be the splitting of our 3D orbital energies 
in an isolated Fe2 plus ion, so an Fe2 plus forms an octahedral complex. Okay. So let's just write this as delta E. So bipyridine, bipi, I guess that's how it's pronounced. Bipi is a bidented ligand. Explain what is meant by a bidented ligand. So you've got bi, which obviously means two. So two dative bonds. That's what dentation talks about in the case of transition elements. So two dative bonds formed. So it's a ligand which forms two dative bonds by the donation of two lone pairs to the transitional transition metal ion the complex fe by pi 3 2 plus exists as two stereoisomers complete the three dimensional diagrams to show the two stereoisomers of fe by pi 3 plus, 3 2 plus state the type of stereoisomers I'm shown okay so let's see one bi pi molecule is going to form two dative bonds. So, and Fe, it forms six bonds in total. So, let's see. So, stereoisomerism, it's the three dimensional isomerism. So, it depends on the spatial arrangement of the groups. Okay, so let's see. N and okay, you can form this over here, and then you can form N N, and then so this is one of the ways you can form. So this lies on the plane, this comes forward from the plane, and this goes backward from the plane. So let's do something opposite than that over here. Over here, you've got the bond between one which is lying on the plane and the other which is beneath the plane. Over here, let's make the bond rather between the one which lies above the plane and the one which is beneath the plane. And a bond over here between the one which is over here. So if you look at this way, you see that these are mirror images of each other. So what sort of an isomer has mirror images? These are optical isomers. So optical isomerism is the type of stereoisomerism in this case. Standard electrode potentials can be used to compare the stability of different complex ions for a given transition element. Use relevant data to state which iron three complex is hardest to reduce. Explain your choice. Okay, so a synonym for the standard electrode potential is also the standard reduction potential. So a tip is that the higher the standard reduction potential is, the easier it is to reduce. So over here, the one with the lowest one is FECN6. Okay, so FECN6, 3 minus. And another way to visualize this is that the higher this is, the lower Gibbs free energy becomes. 
and lower Gibbs free energy means it is more feasible and in turn more easy to reduce. So over here you've got a low value of the electrode potential, so a high value of the Gibbs free energy. High Gibbs free energy, harder to reduce. So basically you should you could just say um the you could explain it in terms of the Gibbs free energy or you could also explain it in terms of the equilibrium so over here over here the equilibrium lies mostly to the left so since the equilibrium lies mostly to the left the electrode potential is also less and in turn harder to reduce. The ligand bipyridine consists of two pyridine rings, pyridine C5H5N and benzene C6H6 have similar planar cyclic structures. By reference uh, to the hybridization of the carbon atoms and the nitrogen atoms, an orbital overlap suggests how the Sigma and pi bonds are formed in pyridine molecules. So let's see. Everything's planar, everything's cyclic. So this is similar to benzene. So all carbon and nitrogen are sp2 hybridized so that they are planar. So how are these? Sigma bonds formed. So sigma bonds are formed by the end on end or head on overlap of the orbitals in the case of carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon nitrogen bonds, carbon carbon bonds. And the pi bonds, they are formed by the sideways overlapping or lateral overlapping of orbitals. So you just see the ring over here. So that means that no hydrogens are involved in the pi bond. So you've only got the sideways overlapping between the carbon carbon or carbon nitrogen. So Basically, in a pi bond, you've got the p orbitals overlapping sideways like this, leading to a pi bond. Meanwhile, in the case of sigma bond, you've got these orbitals overlapping, forming sigma bonds. So that's pretty much how the sigma bonds formed and pi bonds are formed. Pyridine reacts with Cl2 in the presence of AlCl3. So a quick glance, this is similar to how benzene reacts. Yeah, that's what it says. Complete the diagram to show the mechanism for the reaction of pyridine with Cl+. So, like in the case of benzene, the ring which is inside it donates its electrons to Cl+. And in turn, you can write it as okay. So Cl and hydrogen, and you've got nitrogen over here. Okay, so nitrogen. So once the ring which attacks the Cl plus, the delocalization it stops. So the ring is broken over here, and it has a plus charge. Now the hydrogen, it leaves this molecule, donating its lone pair of electrons, and again, bringing the delocalization of electrons. Nitrogen, okay, one, two. And that is pretty much how 3-chlorpyridine is formed. And yeah, you've got plus H plus over here.
compare the relative acidities of benzoic acid, phenyl methanol, and phenol. So what is benzoic acid? Benzoic acid is, okay, C-O-O-H. Okay, so this is benzoic acid. Phenyl methanol, okay, C-O-H, H-H. So this is methanol part and the phenyl part. This would be phenyl methanol, and this is phenol. So among these, the most acidic would be benzoic acid, mostly because it's a proper acid, unlike the other ones. So benzoic acid, followed by phenol, which is followed by phenyl methanol so why is benzoic acid the most stable the most acidic one so in the case of benzoic acid you've got negative inductive effects of the co bond and the oxygen c single bond over here so electrons get pushed this way so that would weaken the OH bond, which you can see over here. So in an aqueous solution, benzoic acid can easily lose this proton and formed an uh, salt or a, an ion. So over here, you've got this ion and it's got a negative charge. But this ion, it is also stabilized by resonance. So the double bond over here, it will spread onto over here and the charge, it will get spread. So the de like the, the delocalization of the negative charge will stabilize the carboxylate ions, which is so formed. So that makes benzoic acid the most acidic. And in the case of phenol, you've got O and an H. So over here you've got the lone pair on the oxygen atom over here which gets delocalized. It mixes with the delocalized electrons in the benzene ring. So that makes the OH bond over here as weak as well. So because of that reason phenol comes in number two but phenol doesn't have anything to stabilize the ion which is so formed. Like anything like this over here, like the delocalization of those charge. So it cannot come in first place. So benzoic acid is in first place, phenol is in second place. But in the case of phenyl methanol, you see that this CH2 group, it pushes its electron towards OH. So instead of weakening the OH bond, it instead strengthens the bond. So because the bond is strengthened rather than weakened, it doesn't dissociate as well as the rest of the two. So this is over here in the third place. So if you basically summarize all of those over here, that would be your reasoning. A series of nine separate experiments is carried out as shown in table 5.1. Complete the table by placing a tick in the relevant box if a reaction occurs. Place a cross in the box if no reaction occurs. Okay, so sodium, acid acid metal reaction hydrogen formed it fizzes okay reaction occurs acid metal always reacts naoh benzoic acid okay it reacts na2co3 benzoic acid yep acid and a carbonate reacts to form carbon dioxide so all of these react phenyl methanol let's see sodium and phenyl methanol it reacts, it will form a sodium alkanoate, as far as what I know. So it will form sodium phenyl methanoate in this case. NaOH, phenyl methanol. This is a very, very weak acid. Like it's pathetic to call it even an acid because of the because uh, the bond it's actually strengthened instead of weakened so it rarely acts as an acid so nope the reaction does not occur same over here 
in the case of phenol. Sodium, it reacts, yep. Sodium hydroxide, it reacts. But so, uh, but phenol, it's not strong enough. So, not strong enough to react with sodium carbonate. So, a reaction does not occur in the case of sodium carbonate. Part C, benzoyl chloride can be synthesized by reacting benzoic acid with those sub substances. Complete the reaction for these equations. So what is formed over here? Um, P-O-C-L-3 plus H-C-L, okay. In the case of thionyl chloride, you would get sulfur dioxide and hydrochloric acid as well. Use the answer to C1 to suggest why is it easy to isolate in pure form benzoyl chloride from reaction two compared to reaction one. So let's see. Um, over here, you've got gaseous, gaseous, but over here, this is gaseous. This is liquid. This is liquid, and this is a liquid. So over here in reaction two, you've got, so let's say you do the reaction over here in a vessel like this. At the end of the day, you'll just end up with C6H5COCl. The sulfur dioxide and the HCl, those gases, they'll just go out. But in the case of reaction one, you would end up with benzoyl chloride plus POCl3. So you again need to isolate benzoyl chloride from the solution between POCl3 in the case of reaction one. So because of that, it's easier to isolate in a pure form benzoyl chloride from reaction two compared to reaction one. Benzyl chloride is hydrolyzed by water at room temperature to form benzoic acid. Complete the diagram to show the mechanism for the reaction between benzyl chloride and water. Include charges, dipoles, lone pairs of electrons, and curly arrows as appropriate. Okay, so I find this space a bit too small for me to do it, so let's do it over here. So this is water with its two lone pairs. And over here, this has got a partial positive charge. This has got a partial negative charge. And this also has a partial negative charge to some extent. So the lone pair of water, it attacks the carbon over here, the carbonyl carbon. The bond, this bond goes over here. You end up with C O minus charge C L O single lone pair H H. So now what happens is that the double bond forms again. The chloride it exits. And then you would have and then um O H H. Okay, so this is what you have. And then the chloride over here with its lone pair, it will pull a proton. So at the end, you will get benzoic acid plus HCl, okay. So that's the stuff which happened over here. Name the type of mechanism you showed in D1. So this would be a nucleophilic addition, elimination reaction. So why is it addition elimination? You first add the water over here, then you eliminate HCl from this molecule. So nucleophilic addition elimination. Acyl chlorides react with sodium carboxylates to form acid and hydrides. The condensation 
polymers, polyanhydride and polyester are formed by similar methods. The repeat unit for a polyanhydride is shown in figure 5.2. So suggest the structures of two monomers. Okay, so let's see what's repeating over here. So we see that this part is quite repeating. Okay, that's cool. And then you also have a part which is repeating over here. So two repeating stuffs. So let's say, let's see what this is. So the two monomers would be CH2. Okay, this is quite small to write over here. I'll do it over here. So C. CH2, CH2, CH2O. Okay, so that's one of them. And then you've got O, C, CH2, 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 C, O, O. Okay, so over here it says acyl chloride plus sodium carboxylate so one of them needs to be an acyl chloride and the other should be a sodium carboxylate so let me just call this the acyl chloride and this the sodium carboxylate and a so those are your two monomers polyanhydrides are biodegradable polymers so just how this polyanhydride can be degraded so where's our polyanhydride? Okay, so what type of a bond is this? So we have this sort of a bond. So how are we going to degrade this? Basically, a hydrolysis. This is a condensation polymer. So hydrolysis by heating in a solution of a dilute acid or alkali. So base catalyzed hydrolysis or acid catalyzed hydrolysis, any of them would work. So question six. So we are approaching the end of this paper. Describe what is meant by a racemic mixture. A racemic mixture, it's a mixture of two optical isomers in equal proportions. So whatever this is, is an amino acid that contains a car carbon atom and displays stereoisomerism. Separate samples of asparagine are dissolved in CdCl3 and analyzed using carbon-13 and proton NMR spectroscopy. Predict the number of peaks seen in the carbon-13 and proton NMR spectra of asparagine. Okay, number of peaks, carbon-13. So the number of peaks of carbon-13, it depends on the number of unique carbon environments that you have in that molecule. And for the proton NMR, it depends on the number of unique proton environments. So let's see what are the unique carbon environments over here. Okay, so this is unique. This is bonded to NH2, O, CH2. This is also unique to, um, this is unique as well as three, four. Okay. So four carbon 13 NMR peaks. So let's talk about the proton NMR. So over here, you've got COOH. Okay, so this is one environment. Let me erase the rest of those. 
So over here, this is one unique environment. Then NH2. Okay, so this is another environment, two. Um, this hydrogen would be three, four, because these are unique environments on either sides of the carbon atom. They are equivalent protons. And five for the hydrogen in the NH2 over here. Because over here it's bonded to a carbon bonded to an oxygen. And over here it's a carbon which is bonded to an acid group and an alkyl group. So five unique proton environments. Okay. The isoelectric point of asparagine is at 5.4. Describe the meaning of the term isoelectric point. So an amino acid... It's got a base part and an acid part. So C R N H two H C O O H. This is a standard amino acid. In an acidic condition, you would have this change to an N H three plus. In a basic condition, you would see this change to COO minus. But for every amino acids, there is a pH. So between one to 14, there is a specific pH in which these charges, both of these charges are present. So it's CH3, so it's COO minus as well as NH3 plus. So at this case, you would see that because of the minus and the plus, so minus, plus, cancel out, known overall charge. So there's a specific pH at which that occurs. So the isoelectric point is the pH at which an amino acid bears no overall charge. So the isoelectric point of asparagine is 5.4. So at 5.4, asparagine has both the plus charge and the negative charge. pH, which is above 5.4 for asparagine, is basic. But if the pH is lesser than 5.4 for asparagine, that is the acidic condition. So if we're talking about asparagine, 7 is a neutral. So 7... so 5.4 is what we call 7 in the case of asparagine, if you think it in the way how asparagine sees the world. So over here, 5.4. Lesser than 5.4, acidic. 5.4, neutral. This is basic, okay. So in the case of asparagine, H2N, C, O, CH2, CH, NH2, COOH. Okay, so at pH of 1, this is a basic condition for asparagine. So over here, this NH2, it will bear a plus charge. So one thing that you have to remember about amino acids is that in the case of an amino acid, this is the structure of an amino acid, COOH, H, and an R group. In the case of asparagine over here, let's see. This is our COOH group. This is our amino group. This is our hydrogen. And this is our R group. So this R group, it will not be bearing the charge. Only this amine group will bear the charge in this case. So this this constitutes the R group. So this is the amine part of the amino acid. This is the acid part. And this over here, it's the R group. 
Aspargine can polymerize to form polyaspargine. Draw the structure of polyaspargine, showing two repeat units. The peptide linkage should be sh shown displayed. Okay, so let's talk about it again. Over here, the peptide bond, it forms between these acid group and these um, amine groups. So even if you have an amine over here, the peptide linkage will not form with that. The peptide linkage will form with this amine group over here and this acid group. So let's do that. So the structure of polyasparagine would be NH, CH, CH2, CO, NH2, CO, NH, CH, CH2, C, double bonded O, NH2, C, O. Okay, so this is the structure of polyasparagine. The isoelectric point of lysine is at pH 9.8. A mixture of the dipeptide lysine and asparagine is and its two constituent amino acids, asparagine and lysine, is analyzed by electrophoresis using a buffer at pH 5.0. The results obtained are shown in figure 6.3. Okay, so the buffer is at pH 5.0. Let's see what of which of these are what. So E, which is over here, this would be asparagine. Why would this be asparagine? Asparagine has a isoelectric point of 5.4, okay. And this would be lysine. So the mixture was over here halfway through. So our condition over here is a pH of 5.0 and 5.4, which is the isoelectric point of lysine, is above 5.0. So asparagine over here, it bears a positive charge because it's in a acidic medium, considering the isoelectric point of asparagin. So because asparagin bears a positive charge, it travels towards the negative electrode. And now lysine. Lysine has a P isoelectric point of 9.8. The condition over here is 5.0. A pH of 5.0 is way, way, way smaller than a pH of 9.8. So lysine, it is quite more basic than asparagine in this case. So lysine has a more positive charge. It travels more towards the negative. And now let's talk about lysine and asparagine, the dipeptide. So the dipeptide, it its isoelectric point would sort of be between 5.0 and 9.8. However, because of its very, very high molecular weight compared to asparagin and lysine, it stays about halfway through. So this is asparagin, this is lysine, this is asparagin and lysine. So let's see. Asparagin has a very low charge lice and lice asn is positive lice asn has a high mr so stays behind Thin layer and gas liquid chromatography can be used to analyze mixtures of substances. Each type of chromatography makes use of a stationary phase and a mobile phase. So complete table 6.1 with an example of each of these. So TLT, what is the stationary phase in this? So this would be silica. Or you could also use alumina, anything you wish. 
And in the case of, okay, gas liquid chromatography, it would be an inert gas. For example, nitrogen. An unknown amino acid is analyzed using TLC, two chromatographs of unknown amino acid and four reference amino acid P, Q, R, and S are obtained using two different solvents. Okay, P, Q, R, S, two different solvents. Identify the um, unknown amino acid. So the unknown amino acid, it's over here. So the rest which are over here are Q and S. So we can cross the rest of these off. So P and R are not possible answers. So cross P and R off. Now let's again check where the unknown amino acid is in the case over here. So the unknown amino acid, it's on the level of R and S, but we've already crossed R out over here, so it cannot be R. So S has shown to be on the level of the unknown amino acid in both cases using both solvents. So the unknown amino acid is S. Um, same distance traveled in different solvent. So instead of distance, I guess RF would be a more suitable term to use. A mixture containing three organic compounds is analyzed by gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. The gas chromatogram is shown. The area underneath each peak is proportional to the mass of respective compound in the mixture. Calculate the concentration of L in the mixture. So L has an area of 58. So let's see. Um, mass of L equals to 58. times 5.52 times 10 to the power negative 2. We're just taking the mass of K. So we can deal this as a ratio to be fair. 58 divided by 44. So the mass of L and the mass of K will be in this ratio. And the concentration of K is 5.52 times 10 to the power negative 2 grams per dm cube. So 58 divided by 44. So the mass and the concentration, the units of volume will cancel out. So mass of L equals to 58 divided by 44 times 5.52 times 10 to the power negative 2. So 58 divided by 44 times 5.52 times 10 to the power negative 2 would be 7.28 times 10 to the power negative 2 gram. Okay. So we have the mass of L. And now we're told to find the concentration of L in the mixture. So the concentration of L would be 7.28 times 10 to the power negative 2 divided by 116 which is 6.27 times 10 to the power negative 4 
mole per dm cube. So we've got the concentration of K in the mixture. Now we've got the concentration of L in mole per dm cube. So this would be 6.27 times 10 to the power negative 4 mole per dm cube. Procaine is used as an anesthetic in medicine. It can be synthesized from methylbenzene in five steps. Name all the functional groups which are present in procaine. So where's procaine? Okay, so this is procaine. So what are the groups over here? So uh, amine group. What is this? So this over here, you've got an acid part, alcohol part, ester, aryl group. Okay, so name all the functional groups present in procaine. So, and this is also an amine group over here. So you've got an amine group, you've got an aryl group, you've got an ester group. So these are the functional groups which are present in procaine. A molecule of procaine has 13 carbon atoms. State the number of carbon atoms that are sp, sp2, and sp3 hybridized in procaine. Okay, so let me rub this off. So over here in benzene, you've got six sp2 carbon atoms. And this carbon over here, it is bonded to three groups. So this is also another sp2. So this is bonded to three, one, two, three, four, times two, so five, six, six sp3. So six sp3, six plus one, seven sp2, zero sp. The proton NMR of procaine dissolved in D2O is recorded. Predict the number of peaks observed. So the number of peaks observed would be um, one peak, two peak, three, four. Okay, so all of these are equivalent CH2, CH2. You've got no hydrogens over here, no hydrogens over here, so and these are equivalent, so one peak, two peaks. So two peaks over here. And let's talk about these. Three, four, five, six. So in total, you'll have six proton NMR peaks. Let me just do this to make it more clear. So CH2, CH2, nitrogen, CH2, CH3, CH2, CH3, NH2, okay. So these two over here, they are equivalent. So one peak till now, these two are equivalent. So two peaks till now. And let's see over here. This has got two equivalent hydrogen atoms bonded on either side. So three peaks, four peaks. Now let's talk about these. So these two hydrogens and these two hydrogens, they are basically the same. So five peaks, these and these, they are the same. So six peaks. So you've got six proton NMR peaks. Let's talk about why procaine can act as a base now. So why can pro procaine act as a base? So procaine has got lone pairs on the nitrogen. So the nitrogens, they have lone pairs. So they can accept hydrogen ions, protons. So procaine is a base because it can accept protons. Can accept protons due to lone pair on nitrogen atoms. 
over here. Compound X can be synthesized in two steps from methyl benzene. So compound X, two steps, okay. Draw the structure of compound W in the box provided. So let's see, we need a COOH over here. So how can we form a COOH? It can be formed by the side chain oxidation. And you also need a nitro group. So for the nitro group, you can use the nitrating mixture. So let's see whether we will first convert it to a COOH, then add a nitro group, or first convert, add a nitro group, then COOH. Okay, so if you first have a COOH, the COOH will direct these the incoming nitro group to the position over here and the position over here but that's not what we want we want the nitro group to be in the one two three four fourth position not three and five so we will not convert it to a coh in the first step so this is out of the picture so at first we will add the nitro group the ch3 it will direct the nitro group over here to the fourth position okay and then we will be doing side chain oxidation so this is our compound w ch3 no2 okay state the reagents and conditions for step one and step two so the nitrogen mixture will be used so concentrated hno3 concentrated H2SO4 and for the side chain oxidation we'll be using hot alkaline KMNO4 followed by treatment with and dilute acid so procaine is synthesized in three steps from X. Suggest the reagents for condition step four and step five in figure 7.1. So step four and step five. Okay, so let's see. We formed an ester. Okay, in step four, we formed an ester. So what are we going to use? We're going to use the corresponding alkyls. H O ch2 ch2 n ch2 ch3 whole 2 okay so that's our corresponding alcohol now step 5 in step 5 we converted the nitro group to an amine group so it got reduced so tin hcl concentrated hcl Okay, so it should be concentrated plus reflux. Okay, so that's crucial. What is the partition coefficient KPC? Basically, the partition coefficient, it's an equilibrium constant. So let's say you've got two liquids in a vessel over here. So liquid one and liquid two. And these two liquids, okay, that's not the best way how you show two liquids like that. Let's do it this way. Okay, so you've got two liquids, liquid one, and over here, you've got liquid two. So liquid one and liquid two, they are immiscible. They do not mix with each other. But you introduce a compound. Let's name that compound X. And compound X, it dissolves in both liquid one and liquid two. But the ratio in which compound X dissolves in these two, that's different. So the molecules of compound X, they are actually in dynamic equilibrium between these two liquids. So compound X 
liquid two, x liquid one. Okay, so you have an equilibrium which forms over here. So this equilibrium, it will obviously have a equilibrium constant. So that equilibrium constant, Kpc, is the concentration in liquid 2 over liquid 1, or even the other way around, whatever way you want to call it. So, okay, so the partition coefficient Kpc is the ratio of concentration of a solute in two solvents at equilibrium. The partition coefficient of procaine between octanol and water is 1.77. Okay. So between octan 1 ol and water. Okay. So procaine concentration in octanol over the concentration of procaine in water is 1.77. Octan 1 ol and water are immiscible. A solution containing 0 0.500 gram of procaine in 75.0 cm cube of water is shaken with 50 cm cube of octanol. Calculate the mass of procaine that is extracted into octan 1 ol. So, Let's see over here, you've got 1.77 equals the concentration of procaine in octanol. So let's say X amount is in octanol. So X over, over 50 is in octanol. That's the concentration in octanol, the volume of concentration, the volume of octanol and the mass. So 0 0.5 minus X is in water divided by the volume of water, which is 75. So basic algebra, you would get X equals um, somewhere around 0 0.271 gram. So that is your mass of procaine, which is in octanol. So 0 0.271 gram and that's pretty much it for this paper so we've completed a level chemistry paper for one from may june 2022 mm, thank you so much Sarvesh, for your time today and both of us hope you have a better understanding of this paper thank you so much see you next week <laughs>